Good afternoon. I hope the presentation and the discussions this morning were helpful for you. In this session, which is recorded, the focus is on enhancing the learning potential of workplaces. And how I'd like to proceed is in this session, refer to um, the focus on the workplace as a learning environment, and in particular, focusing on the concept of the practice curriculum or the learning curriculum. And that is the organization and enactment of experiences in the workplace and how these can develop the kind of capacities which um, people need for their work. That's what we'll do this in this session. And then tomorrow we will focus on practice pedagogies, uh, which are the processes of augmenting and supporting learning through work. And then also a consideration of individuals' personal epistemologies. And that is the means by which individuals come to engage in and learn through their work. So those will be two live sessions tomorrow. And this, of course, is supported by the handout which you've received. Okay, so this concept of practice or learning curriculum, which is the sequence of experiences that um, individuals engage in in the workplace and through which they learn. Now, it's, it's, it's probably important to commence with some curriculum concepts so that we can apply these to our understanding of how people learn through work. And perhaps the most important point and principal point to make is the origins of the word curriculum refers to the course to run, the track to follow, or the pathway to progress along. That is a series of experiences. So the concept that we'll be referring to here is quite central to understandings of the word curriculum. And anthropological studies that look at how people develop knowledge to continue and enact cultural practices, notice that there are sets of pathways that individuals progress along. Because this is about curriculum, um, I want to emphasize three very important conceptions of curriculum that apply to what happens in education institutions as much as what happens in workplace. The first one of these is the intended curriculum. That is what is to be achieved through educational experiences. So in schools and universities and colleges, there's often a document called a syllabus and that's used to set out what is supposed to happen and the kind of learning outcomes that are to be achieved. And you'll notice that these are referred to as intended learning outcomes because they can never be guaranteed. Then there is the enacted curriculum. And that is what happens when experiences are provided for learners, albeit in education institutions or in the workplaces. And what is enacted is a product of a range of factors, including the kind of activities and interactions that are made available to learners. And that's the case, again, regardless of whether we're talking about what occurs in, in um, educational settings or in workplaces. So this is what happens. And the third form of curriculum, as somebody principally interested in learning, this is perhaps the most important one, and that is the experience curriculum. That is what individuals experience and learn from what is, what is provided for them, what is enacted. And that is that as individuals engage in experiences, it, they engage in the process of construing and constructing knowledge from what they experience. That is, humans are active meaning makers and they will make sense of experiences and they'll do so in different ways. And that's why it's helpful to separate the concept of experiences that, that happen 
but also the process of experiencing. That is how people come to make sense of and experience those. So in the diagram on the right hand side, you'll see a, a, a set of pathways and people will take different pathways according to their needs and according to how they want to go and where they want to go. So whereas you, the, a pathway might be set out, people will use the pathways in particular, reason, for, in, in particular ways to meet their, their purposes. So these are important conceptual foundations to understanding curriculum, that the original meaning of the word curriculum is about a course of activities which, along which you progress and that these have been identified within anthropology as the means by which uh, people engage in culturally derived practices to learn them and progress along them. And so there's the intended curriculum, what's supposed to happen, the enacted curriculum, the realities of what happens when experiences are provided. And then thirdly, um, the experience curriculum, and that is um, how people come to learn from what is provided for them. So the practice or, or workplace curriculum. Across the literature, it's possible to identify that there are two broad ways of categorizing the way that people learn through practice. The first one is referred to as apprenticeship as a way of life. And that is what happens when you simply engage in and learn through the lived experience of participating within a particular community. And here we have examples from Jordan who referred to the process of midwives, uh, birth attendants in Mexico, by participating in the practice of, of, of birth attendants, coming to learn its practices. And then Bunn, um, who um, researched nomadic tribes in Kyrgyzstan, found that uh, young people learned much of the knowledge they required to be effective in those communities simply by engaging in the lived experiences. And that is that they learned how to ride horses, how to herd cattle or yaks, how to capture animals, how to skin animals, and how to use every part of the animal for different kinds of purposes beyond what, what is eaten. And that they learned these skills simply through participating in the community, and there was very little evidence of teaching. So this is how largely how people have learned occupations across much of human history, for instance, that in earlier times, particularly before industrialization, you learned the skills that were being used within your family and that, you know, that whatever the family business was, you engaged in it from a very early age and you learned those skills and you participated it in the lived experience which was played out within the household. Then secondly, there's the deliberate structuring of experiences. And, and this is when the, the provision of experiences alone um, through everyday activity is insufficient. And Bunn provides an example here. So for instance, although much of the knowledge required to be effective in these nomadic tribes in uh, Kyrgyzstan came through the lived experience, there were certain skills that could only be required, acquired through particular kinds of deliberate structuring of experiences. One of those was learning to be a blacksmith. So to, to learn to become a blacksmith meant you had to leave your family and go and be apprenticed in the family that did blacksmithing. Similarly, to be um, a maker of the yurts, these homes that the nomadic tribes lived in, you had to go and live in and be part of a family whose role it was to actually make the yurts, those mobile homes. And then if you wanted to be a traditional storyteller, what you had to do was to, again, you had to engage in a long-term apprenticeship with one of those storytellers to learn the, the, the epic stories and to learn how to enact them. And all of this was deliberately structured simply because you would not learn those forms of knowledge within your own family. Now, as we stand back and look in contemporary times, it's far more likely that we will learn through deliberate structuring of experiences rather than apprenticeship as a way of life. 
Yes, if you live in and grow up on a farm, for instance, you might learn many of the skills required uh, to be a farmer. But most of the skills that we learn um, have to come from other experiences, structured experiences, because uh, they're not part of our, our lived experience. So the ordering of experiences seems to be important. And what we see from studies, um, particularly from anthropology, is that there's often a sequencing of experiences. So for instance, uh, Jean Lave, in her studies of uh, understanding how tailors learn their craft, found that the principle behind the progression that the apprentice tailors engaged in was moving from um, activities where if mistakes were made, there would be little limited consequences through to activities where if an error was made, the consequences would be greater. So for instance, um, apprentice um, tailors, first, look, first of all, started making children's undergarments. And if they made a mistake with those garments, it wasn't a problem. Then they went on to make um, uh, adults undergarments and you know, slightly more uh, care was needed and a higher level of skills. Then they went on to make adults outer garments and shirts and the likes. And then later they finished off by making ceremonial garments where they, the garments were made with expensive fabric. And if mistakes were made, there were high error costs. So just as you would not put a novice to manage in a very expensive piece of equipment, um, but rather somebody who knew how to use that piece of equipment, the principle played out here in terms of this sequence in experience where uh, the movement was from low error risk to, the, to situations where um, error risk came at a greater cost. So for instance, this is, is, this is the case in, 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 in tailoring, also in the studies that I had done of hairdressers. Firstly, apprentice hairdressers start by washing clients' hair. Actually, they don't. They start, first of all, by greeting um, clients into the hairdressing salon. And then they start asking them if, for instance, they want tea or coffee. And if so, black or white or with sugar or without sugar. And then they move on to keeping the hairdressing salon neat and tidy. Now, these, these tasks might seem to be busy work but they're actually very important. Greeting the customers develops the skills in communicating with customers and finding out their needs. And keeping the salon clean and tidy is important for developing skills about tidiness, looking after tools, and keeping a workplace which is healthy and safe. Then they go on to start working with clients. And one of the first tasks they do is wash the client's hair. And this often occurs in part of the hairdressing salon that is quiet and then the hairdresser can engage in conversation with the clients. One of the next tasks they do is actually washing the hair, but washing chemicals out of the hair after dyes have been used or, um, or, or perm solutions have been used to bring about effects in the hair. And that's a greater risk because if all of the dyes and chemicals are not taken out, you can get some interesting effects. And so it's a more, um, uh, it's a task that has risk consequences associated with it. Then the hairdressers go on to perform simple um, tasks such as putting curling rods in hair and they practice that. Um, and then they engage in other forms of, of preparing the hair. And then normally uh, what they have to do before they cut women's hair they have to practice on men. Because if they make a mistake with a man's hair, it's not a big problem. But if they make a mistake with women's hair, it's a very big problem. Similarly with production workers, in studies that have done the production workers, what I found there is that um, there's often a sequence that occurs that the novice will move through. And in one uh, factory which produced breakfast cereal, uh, they actually start in the packaging room and then move forward to where the cereals are manufactured. The point is that they need to know what, what, what happens to the end product, how the end product is organized, how getting the right amount of, um, of cereal in the sachets is important to fit in the boxes, 
And then as they come forward, then they know the kind of goals that they need to achieve in mixing the cereal and putting them in the sachets. And then there's the, the example of room attendance. Now, this is a small hotel in Singapore called the Marina Bay, uh, Marina Bay Sands, I beg your pardon. It's a 1,300 rooms and it dominates the um, skyline around the harbour area. And this um, hotel, as I said, has 1,300 rooms, but they have great difficulty hiring room attendants in Singapore because Singaporeans don't want to do this kind of work. So they bring people over from, um, from mainland China, from Thailand, Indonesia, etc., to do this, this kind of work. However, many of those do not speak English, but they have a very base curriculum that the process that they go through. Firstly, the room attendant works in a room that is without guests. That is the guests have left. It's called a checked out room. In that room, the novice attendee, attendee learns how to organize the bathroom, make the bathroom nice and clean, put all of the utensils out and the cloths and the soaps and things out in a particular way, make the bed up in a particular way, which includes getting the pillows tightly in the pillowcases and placing them on the bed like that, and then making the, the bed very nice and tight. Only when the room attendant has, has demonstrated their competence to do that task well and to do it at a certain pace are they moved into checked in rooms. The point there is that once they're in a checked in room, they might encounter a guest and will need to be engaging with the guests. So before they reach that point, um, the idea is that they will have developed the skills associated with being a room attendant and know how to prepare the room um, in, a, in a very competent way. So they're not actually consciously focusing on that and then can engage with the uh, clients. So, and also with doctors, um, there's a process that Sinclair referred to as when junior doctors start in hospitals, uh, what often happens is they're asked to do the history taking and the examination of patients that have already had that done. And then the, 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 the novice doctor then goes and reports to the senior clinician and says, this is what the, the history is, and this is what came out of my examination. And they check on that. So this is a practice of moving through from a situation where um, an, if an error occurs um, at, the, at the beginning, there's little, little limitations, so little cost to it, but as you progress, um, where errors can be more demanding. There's also other kind of pathways, and I'll talk about this in a minute. But one of them, for instance, is what Singleton identified in Japan in, in a place which makes um, uh, teapots, uh, Japanese ceremonial teapots. And that is the key pathway of experience was being able to access and engage with a key artifact, which is the potter's wheel upon which the, the clay is turned and turned into the pottery artifacts. So in this uh, sheet, which is in your, the first table of your handout, uh, we have a number of these um, different uh, pathways, different curriculum practices that are applicable to workplaces. The first one of these is uh, the apprenticeship as a way of life. And I've referred to that already in terms of what Bunn reported and what Jordan reported in terms of the progression and what Lave reported. Uh, Makovici, by the way, uh, her study was on uh, the production of lace and the way that that progressed through from um, easier type of lace making through to more complex um, kind of ways. And in this table, what you'll see in the right hand column is the practice. In the middle column, there's the description. And in the right hand column, what is, is the, uh, the purposes of actually this model of curriculum. And I'm hoping that these will provide interesting examples for you. And the, the next one down is, sorry, that's the practice one. And here is the, the uh, sequence of experiencing. And this then is uh, the, the pathway that comes through so that people can actually 
learn tasks and move in a progression which develops those kinds of uh, capacities. And this third one is, um, is also a, a, a program of development, a learning curriculum. And this is um, a process through which, um, a, which would I've already referred to as moving from activities that have low risk associated with them through to activities which have greater risk associated with them. And the fourth one is the one from the pottery studies. And what, what happens here is that the, the sequence of learning is very much dependent upon the novice's access to the potter's wheel. And this is used for production purposes. So the, its use is important and the apprentice's time on it is, needs to be worked around when it's not being used for production purposes. First of all, however, the apprentice has to observe what happens and observe um, in a way that allows them to see how the experienced potters hold their hands and, and form the clay. And they do that observation while they're engaged in cleaning activities in and around the potting potter wheel. And then what they do is then they actually um, are able to use the potter's wheel during lunch breaks and in the evenings when the wheel isn't being used and they can experiment on it and try and get the sense of a feel for it. And then they move on to having structured practice to build their capacities um, more effectively. And then eventually they engage in a process of, of, of a series of activities of making fairly basic pots, which are then used for particular purposes and perhaps sold to cover the cost of their, um, uh, their apprenticeship. And then the, the, the fifth model here I'm just going to explain is, is what's called parallel practice. And this is when um, the novice does something in parallel with the more experienced worker. So in the case of a medical student, in this case, learning how to um, do examinations and history taking of patients, what happens is that the medical student or junior doctor works in a parallel consulting room to the experienced doctor. And the, the student or junior medical doctor will do the history taking of the patient and do the examination of the patient, and then will ask the qualified doctor to come in and they'll share with them the history taking and the, uh, uh, the results of their examination. And then they'll discuss then the treatment. So all of these are different pathways of activities and they're based upon the idea that there's a particular sequence of activities. However, the sequence of those activities are associated with what is applicable to the particular workplace. That one of the key ones that's been reported here is moving through from engaging in activities where if you make a mistake, it's not a problem, and then moving on to more and more complex. So many years ago, um, I was working in the clothing industry and, and as a, a pattern maker, what I did first of all was make the interlining patterns for garments and also the lining patterns for garments. And once I developed those skills, I was allowed then to start cutting the patterns for the cloth components of garments. So once I developed the skills and the accuracy in my pattern making, smoothness of line, etc., I was allowed to move through. And then the final thing that um, I, I learned how to pattern cut was the making of collars, which are very important and have to be done prop properly. So these are um, models of curriculum. Now, how do we work out the, the pathway of, of, of the experiences that we need to organize in a particular workplace? So developing the workplace curriculum. And from some studies done earlier, um, it would seem that, that the following are helpful. Firstly, we um, need to identify the sequence of act activities to be learned. So um, what, in what sequence should the activities ideally be learned? And then identifying those that are hard to learn. So 
Why is that important? Well, one of the reasons for identifying um, tasks that are hard to learn is that um, these are the activities which most likely require particular support or particular augmentation. These are the activities which likely require particular workplace pedagogies to assist the learning. So there are lots of things that, as with the lived experience, you can learn through observation and imitation. There'll also be some things which require um, um, engagement and support to learn. So for instance, one of the few instances of teaching that you can identify in the anthropological literature associated with learning cultural practices is hands-on. And that is when potters place their hands upon the hands of apprentices to help them get the feel of the clay as the clay is turning on the, on the potter's wheel so they, they get the sense of it because it's difficult for the, no, the novice to get that, that sense of feel. So identifying those things which are hard to learn, they can become the target for, um, for use, the use of, of, of um, practice pedagogies, which we'll talk about uh, tomorrow. It's also worthwhile when you're asking people about the, the activities that people engage in in the workplace is to use a, a basic you know, type such as asking them the things they do you know, daily, weekly, monthly or yearly, but also ask them about the things that they need to know but may never use. So by looking at things that are done daily, you get the sense of the routine activities that need to be learned. Then monthly things that occur from time to time, which are you know, um, not happening all the time, but need to be done. And then yearly events that come up at least once a year. So for instance, hairdressers often find a real challenge in catering to a bridal party where all the women come in and there's a need to make their hair in some way look consistent. And they might have very different types of hair. They might have very different types of history of treatments in their hair. And this then becomes a, a task which they don't have to face every week, but it comes up um, from time to time. And this is something they need to learn to do. So you can ask people what they do, you know, uh, daily, weekly, monthly. It's also interesting because in many workplaces, there are particular times of the week or times of the day when work becomes very intense. So in the hospitality sector, for instance, the service time of meals or preparation for meals, if you're working in the kitchen, these are very busy times. Um, also, um, um, within hairdressing, for instance, you'll often find that it is Friday and Saturdays, which is most busy and most intense, whereas during the week it be, can be quieter. But you might wonder, why should we try and find out things that people need to know but may never use? Well, let me give you an example. Most of us used to fly around a lot in planes um, and the, the cabin crew of planes need to know how to evacuate the plane if there's an emergency. Now, we, we hope that, that they never have to use those skills, certainly on the plane that we're flying in. But while, although they might not need to use them, um, they need to know how to evacuate the plane. So there's gonna be tasks that people need to know that they may never have to use. So we need to find those and, and, and find ways of assisting learning the, those kind of capacities. So um, who are the best informants? Well, uh, I've interviewed people who are very experienced and people that are very recent. And one of the views I've formed is that people who have recently learned tasks are more aware of the difficulties and what was hard to learn than those who learnt them many years ago. So you might find it useful to try and identify people who've recently learned tasks because they're more likely to be able to remember and provide valid insights about the sequencing of activities and how best particular things are learned. On the way through, it's also worthwhile trying to identify what are sometimes called as teachable moments. That is particular experiences which are pedagogically rich. And 
one of these is nurses handovers which i'll come to later and these are moments that um, are particularly potentially rich opportunities for learning and often these are when a problem is being addressed and people have to consider the problem from a number of perspectives talk about it offer post potential solutions and those solutions are then subject to debate and discussion and then some resolution about how to proceed now these are clearly rich learning experiences and when they come as part of everyday work activity they're also often richly built into the day's work and richly contextualized with the kind of thinking and acting which workers need to do in this way the learning then from those experiences can be quite rich so um sometimes it's also important to um, consider a particular kind of sequencing of experiences so let me take an example here and this is um it came from a study of midwifery students and how midwifery students need to to learn the skills to be an effective midwife and midwifery students engage in two kinds of practicum experiences one is referred to as follow-throughs or continuity of care and the other is clinical practice so continuity of care is when the midwife engages and understands the circumstances of the birthing mother and as students what happens is they have to go along to all the meetings that the birthing uh, woman has with her gynecologist with nurses with any kind of medical specialist but also if that woman's experiencing personal social difficulties um, meetings with social welfare workers etc etc um, and then also uh, midwives engage in clinical uh, practice which involves um, inspections of, 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 of the woman the you know, baby in vitro and using devices to take images and listen to heartbeats etc so the question that we were addressing is what should be the sequence of these experiences and what we concluded from interviewing midwives and midwifery students is that the best thing to start with is the follow-throughs or the continuity of care that so that the student midwife can become aware of the circumstances and situations of birthing women and engage in those and develop those understandings before they engage in clinical placements which involves as you'd be aware very intimate examinations and can involve quite critical care decisions and quite critical uh, clinical engagements so what we suggested then is that there were some kind of experiences which probably should precede the clinical experiences and that is the midwifery students engaging with the birthing women to um, participate in those meetings they have with medical people with midwives but also if they've got issues in their lives social workers and welfare agents so they understand the birthing process from the perspective of the birthing woman prior to engaging in clinical placements so that's the end of this brief um, recorded session and the activity arising from this is to get you to think about how the learning curriculum should play out in your workplace or with work with which you are familiar so Thanks for um, uh, participating in this. I hope this is helpful. And Laurent now will be um, taking you uh, forward with this activity.